All right. So, while we get started, I'm going to pass out a few things here that we're going to use today. The first thing is a schedule for the assignments and the material that we're going to cover. And so this is important. And you want to make sure you stay on top of things. OK, here we go. So, you know, please stay on top of things. The course moves a lot faster because it's kind of understood that you understand hypothesis tests and everything is kind of based on that. Okay, so what I want to do today um, is start talking about confidence intervals are essentially a different type of inference. So we have hypothesis tests and we have confidence intervals. So this is chapter 11 in the text. And kind of the idea behind this is you might want to use this in a situation where maybe you're negotiating your salary after you graduate. So you might want to know, you know, what are you worth in the marketplace? So suppose you graduate from Emory Riddle, which you guys will all do, right? And you get a job and you get different job offers. Okay. And so you want to know, um, you know, how should you negotiate? You never accept the salary they give you, you always negotiate. So how much room do you have for negotiation? So you have to know, you know, uh, you know, where do you look for job offers? What's a reasonable starting salary for your position? And how much room do you have for negotiation? So we're going to look at an actual example, see how this works. So let's suppose you get six um, salary offers. Now, we said financial data. What does it normally look like? What does financial data look like? It tends to be right skewed. Remember, income distribution, right, or right skewed. But but there are exceptions. The reason why the reason why it's skewed is because usually when you're looking at income, you're looking at a very heterogeneous population. But if you think about your job search, you're going to be limiting yourself to a specific job, specific region, right? So here's going to be probably a little more normal like, all right? And so you go ahead, you get these job offers, and you want to analyze them. Now, 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 now here's the problem. You can't know the average that all the employers will offer. Okay? That's something we can't know. So this is a population that we can't get at. But this is what we would like to know. Because... These six salary offers, they're only a sample. So we don't know, are they a little on the high side? Are they a little on the low side? Do you have room for negotiation? So we want to get a little better handle on this problem. How do we think about this? Well, here's, here's kind of where you're at. You can get the average. So you might say, OK, I have some salary. So let me take the average, OK? But the problem is that this is just one number. And what you really want to know is you want to know about the precision. How precise is that estimate, right? You'd like to put an error bar around that estimate. That would tell you the values that you think the true average are, are going to lie between. That would give you some idea of, of where the population average was. So this is where the idea of a confidence interval comes in, OK? And again, I just want to emphasize that confidence intervals are a certain type of influence. What are we doing? We have a population. These are all the possible employers. What are you doing? You're getting a sample, right? You're analyzing that sample, getting information from it. In this case, the average salary from those six offers. And what do you want to do? You want to make a generalization about all the possible salary offers that you could get in that area. So this is just another form of inference. And so here's kind of the idea behind the uh, confidence interval. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, uh, I'm going to compute the sample average, OK? So I take my six salary offers, and I average them. I get 54,000. But here's the problem. I know that the average salary for all the employers in that area is never equal to the sample mean, right? Population means never equal to the sample. So what I need to do. Whenever I get an estimate, no matter what it is, I need to put an error bar around that, OK? So as an example, just, just, to, and, and just to kind of illustrate why you have to do this, 
Suppose, as a, as a kind of different example, you and I are both estimating something. We're estimating the average height of maybe students here at Andrew Riddle. And I'm lazy, and I go out and get two students. And I take their average, and I say, well, that's my estimate. And you're a go-getter, and you get a couple hundred students. And you get your average. You both get a number, right? Whose number's better? Probably yours. You have more data. But we, but we talked about central limit theorem. What does it mean for an average to be better? It means that it's closer to the true value. It means that your value is probably more precise. In other words, if we put an error bar around your value, it should be a lot smaller than mine. So that's, a, that's what we're kind of getting at here. So this is, this is the idea. We want to put an error bar around our estimate, and we're going to say that this error bar should contain the population mean. That's what we'd like to do. So this is the basis behind what we call a confidence interval. So here's what we want to note about a confidence interval. A confidence interval is always centered at our estimate. In other words, it's going to be centered at the, at the sample mean. It's a symmetric interval. It doesn't have to be, but we're going to do symmetric intervals. In other words, this is, this is the, 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 in, the lower end point of the interval. This is the upper end point of the interval. And notice that this half width is the same. It's called the margin of error. And all of you know about confidence intervals, even if you don't realize it, because you hear about it on the news all the time. They say, what percentage of people believe in gun control? It's a big thing now, right? Well, what is it? You know, 45% plus or minus 2%. That's that margin of error, plus or minus 2% on each side. So if you ever watch Prairie, how many of you watch Prairie Home Companion? Or used to, I guess it's probably here now. No way, oh well. Well, it, it used to be this radio show on NPR. And at the end, they rolled the credits. And it was the, the a staff statistician was Marge, Jen, or Vera. Marge. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I had to try, you know. OK, so Marge, and, yeah, get it. Uh, anyhow, all right. If you have to explain it, right, it's, it's, no, it's no good. OK, so this is the, this is the confidence interval. So here's going to be our center at 54. And we're going to have to figure out what this, what this, what this margin of error is. Okay, this is the, this is the red portion here. And so this is going to be a confident interval. Confidence interval. In other words, we're confident that the true value for the population mean lies somewhere in this interval here. That's what we're trying to say. And we're going to dis we're going to talk about what what the word confidence means. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out. How do we get a confidence interval when we know the population standard deviation, when we know what sigma is? How do we do that? So, so here's the idea. We're going to suppose that the population standard deviation is known. And the idea is I'm going to want to put a symmetric interval about the sample mean such that a specific number of times for a specific number of samples, OK, that interval is going to contain the true value of the mean. So here's kind of where, where, where we're going with this. So if I say that this is a 95% confidence interval for the population mean, what I'm saying is that if I calculate a whole lot of confidence intervals, in other words, I take one sample, okay, and this is the sample mean, and I compute this confidence interval, we haven't said how we're going to do it, but let's, let's, let's suppose we can do it, okay? And I take a second sample, there's the sample mean, there's the confidence interval, and so on. What it means to be a 95% confidence interval is that for 95% of those samples, the confidence interval that I compute will contain the true value of the of mu. All right? So here's the, here's the key thing to understand, is that the confidence we're talking about, this 95% confidence, it's a measure of how reliable the method is. So when we're talking about the confidence, this is a measure of how reliable the method is. Or in other words, you could think of it as the percentage of times the method works. 
And by works, it means it contains mu, right? That's when it's working. So we could think of this as the percentage of times the method works. In other words, the interval contains mu. So this says nothing about a single interval. This is really a statement about how reliable the method is in general. What it is not, and the way people misinterpret this, is they think 95% confidence means that for a specific interval, there's a 95% probability that mu is going to be in there. And that's not true. Once you compute the confidence interval, there's no more probability. Once you, once you compute this, either it's in there or it isn't. It's like a it's like a die. When you're when you're shaping the die in your hand, there's a one in six chance it's going to come up one. Once you throw the die, there's no more probability. Okay, the probability is gone. The, the, the events already occurred. So this is not the same as a probability. It's important to understand that. So you notice, kind of kind of going back to this theme we had before, we asked the question, what's the difference between statistics and fortune telling? And we said one of the differences was. Yeah, besides the fact that we don't have cool crystal balls, right? The other difference is the fact that we have reliability measure. In other words, I can say my method won't work all the time, but I can tell you what percentage of time it won't work. So when we talk about, talk about hypothesis tests, we said the probability of a type one error is alpha. I can tell you exactly how likely I am to get a false positive. The same thing is true here. I can tell you exactly the percentage of times this method will not work. That's, and that's kind of the key. Okay, so how do we actually do this? So here's what I want to do. I, I, I want you to um, look at that handout that I gave. Did everybody get the handout with the normal distribution here? And what we're going to do is we're going to construct a 95% confidence interval. So here's, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to... to Cut off a little strip of paper, exactly this width. Now, so notice from mu minus two sigma to mu plus two sigma, make a little strip of paper exactly that long. Okay, so I'm just going to fold over it. All right. And, and so once you get that strip of paper, go ahead and fold it over. All right. And put a little line in the center around this folding it in half and putting a little line here. So this is going to be our confidence interval, and this is going to be the center, right? So this is a this is a confidence interval that's it's, it's two standard deviations that has a margin error of, error of two standard deviations, right? So if you think about it, right, you made your paper this long, this is a symmetric interval, so this is two standard deviations here. Everybody good? Okay. All right, so let's, let's, let's have some fun. So what I want you to do is I want you to position your strip so that center line, the center, is at some point in here. In other words, to the left of this value. So go ahead and position your interval anywhere in here. So in other words, I'm going to take the center of my interval right and put it somewhere to the left of mu minus 2 sigma. The center line on here or the end of it? No, no. So, so, the, so the, kind of like the midpoint of your interval, right? Go ahead and, and, and put that, the, the center of that, that interval anywhere 
to the left of mu minus two sigma i. So here's my center, and I'm going to put it somewhere in here, right? Now let me ask you a question. Does that interval contain mu? No, it does not, right? So no matter where you put that little strip of paper, if you put the center somewhere in here, it's not going to contain mu, okay? What about here? It's the same thing, right? So if I go ahead and I put the center of my interval anywhere to the, anywhere to the, to the right, like somewhere here, it's not going to contain mu. So when will it contain mu? When will this interval contain mu? Where does it have to be centered at? Right. So here's what I know. If if I if I have a sample mean somewhere in here, and I put this two sigma margin of error confidence interval, I'm going to contain mu, right? So for any point in here, any sample mean in here, if I choose this as a center of my confidence interval, it's going to contain mu. Everybody believe that? Nothing up my sleeves, right? So here's the million dollar question. What percentage of times will I have a sample mean in here? 95% of the time. So now, does this make sense that this is the 95% confidence interval? So why, so why is that? Why does that make sense now? Right, so the empirical rule tells me there's 95% there's of the sample means here, which means there's a 95% chance I'm gonna get a sample mean in here which means there's a 95% chance once I put that confidence interval on here, it's going to contain mu. That's the, that's the logic, right? So there's a, so if I use a two sigma margin of error, there 95% of the time, that will contain mu. And that's what makes it a 95% confidence interval. Do you want to review that, or does that make sense? If you want to review that, we can go through that again. Everybody's good? See that? Now, so notice that, like you said, we kind of got off easy in the sense that this was pretty easy to construct because two standard deviations just happen to have 95% in here. But what if you said to me, you know what, I'm not satisfied with the 95% confidence interval. I want to be right 99% of the time, not 95% of the time. How could I do that? How could I figure out? So here's what I figured out. I figured out for a 95% confidence interval, I need a margin of error of two standard deviations. How many standard deviations would I need if I wanted to make a 99% confidence interval? How would I figure that out? So let's, let's take a look at how we did this, okay? How did we get this 95% this confidence interval? So here's what we said. This was x bar. So what did we do? Well, we, we basically found the number of standard deviations we needed to contain 95% of the population. Well, notice that if I, if I looked at the z-scores instead, right? If I didn't look at x bar, but I looked at the z-scores, if this is normal, the z-scores have to be standard normal. Right? And the z-scores just tell me the number of standard deviations, which is what I'm after, right? What is this 2? This 2 is a z-score, right? And that's how I actually got this. If you think about it, if you look at a, in a standard normal, and you ask for the z-score that contains 95% of the values, you find out that it's two standard deviations away. So here's what I did instead. This is what's actually going on. I found a z-score that contained 95%, and this z-score happened to be 2. So there's 5% in the tails, right? Which means there's 2.5% in this tail. So this is the z-score corresponding to the 2.5th percentile. That ends up being 2. And that's how I got that number. Now, we didn't go through all this work because we already know by the, by the empirical rule. But if you ask me for the 99th percent confidence, if you ask me for the 99th for the, for, for, for the confidence interval, I would have to go through this, right? So for the 99th for the confidence interval, what I would have to do is I would look at the z-scores, 
And I would say, okay, I want the cutoffs that are going to contain 99% of the population, which means there's 1% out here, which means there's half a percent out here. And then I would find this z-score for half a percent. And that, would, that multiplied by the standard deviation would give me the margin of error. So this is what's, this is what's going on here. Okay. So this is, this is the idea. Now, notice this is one of the reasons why we were interested in this symmetric interval. Remember, they always ask you, you know, what is a symmetric interval that contains the middle 90%? Okay. So now I can actually do this. I can find the symmetric interval that contains the middle 99%, or I could just find this, this z score that contains half a percent. And now, this is the z score I'm going to use to construct the margin of error. So notice what the margin of error is. The margin of error is just equal to the standard deviation of x bar times this z-score. Z this is all of it. And, if, and so if you go ahead and you put this into stack crunch, you know, you find out that for the 99 or 99 percent confidence interval, z for half a percent ends up being 2.58. So now this would be the margin of error for 99 percent confidence interval. This is the margin of error for 95 percent confidence interval. Which one's bigger, the 99 or the 95 percent confidence interval? Which one's wider? The 99. Does it make sense? You're right. So the 99% confidence interval is wider. Does it make sense that it should be wider? What is the difference between these two intervals? To say that it's a 99% confidence interval means what? What does that statement mean? So it means if you generated 100 confidence intervals, how many of them would contain the mean? 99. Well, if I want to be more confident I contain the mean, what do I have to do to the interval? I have to make it wider, right? Notice there's actually a 100% confidence interval. What is it? Minus infinity to positive infinity, okay? That's a 100% confidence interval. I'm totally sure that the mean's somewhere between minus infinity to positive infinity. It's also a useless statement, okay? But there is such a thing as a 100% confidence interval. It's just not really useful. So this is, this, is, this is the price we pay, that to, to be more confident, we have to have a little less precision, okay? We have a little more uncertainty. So this is, this is the idea, okay? And we can actually kind of fill in a few things. So let me just kind of fill in a few things here. If, if we want to write the general formula for the margin of error, Here's how we're going to do it. And, and you have to really kind of be honed in on this point, because this is a little tricky. So I'm going to write the confidence like this. I'm going to write the confidence as 1 minus alpha. I'm going to write the confidence level as 1 minus alpha. So in other words, if I, if I kind of think about an example, right? If I have a 95% confidence interval, This means that alpha is 5%. Okay? So I'm going to think of this as 1 minus alpha times 100%. And if I do that, I should let alpha be 0.05, right? Just to be careful. So, so notice that the confidence level plus alpha is 100%. That's what we're saying, basically. Now, why do I want to do that? Because now I'm going to write the, the margin of error. And here's how I'm going to write the margin of error. I'm going to write the margin of error as a product of two things. The first is the standard deviation of x bar. And the second is a thing called the critical value. And this we already know. We know from the central limit theorem what this is. This is sigma divided by the square root of n. 
So this we already know from the central limit theorem. And what we saw today, how did we get that, how did we get that critical value? Well, we said it was a z-score, right? So for the 95% confidence interval, what did we do? We said there's 95% in the middle, 2.5% in the tails. So I found the z-score corresponding to the 2.5th percentile. So the way this, the way this works is we're going to find the z-score for the alpha over 2 percentile. In other words, this is the z-score that has alpha over 2 in its tail. So this is the z-score that has alpha over 2 in its tail. So whenever we have subscripts in statistics, these are things that are describing what this is. This is the z-score corresponding to the alpha over 2 percentile. So if we think about this example with a 95% confidence interval, so for a 95% confidence interval, we said alpha was 0.05. So this will be the z-score corresponding to 0.025. In other words, this is the probability that I'm going to put into StatCrunch, right? And this is the number that I'm going to get out for that percentile. Questions that we have. So new concepts, some new notation also. Now, here comes the harder part. So this, this, is, this, is, this isn't too bad, but now here comes the hard part. What if we don't know the population standard deviation? This becomes a problem. When I was a student, I always thought it was kind of hokey because basically we're saying that we don't know the mean, Right? We're trying to get this confidence interval that contains mu, we don't know it. But yet we know the standard deviation for the population. How is that possible? What is the standard deviation? It's the average distance from the mean. Well, if you don't know what the mean is, how can you tell me what the average distance is? Now, in reality, in practice, what happens is sometimes we know from past experience what sigma is. But very often we don't. And usually the better practice is to be honest and be a little conservative and say, I don't really know what sigma is either. And so this is the situation that we're in now. This is the more common situation. So the question is, what do we do? Well, we introduce something new called a t-score. So here's the deal. If we know sigma, okay, we know that the sample mean look like this from the central limit theorem, and we know that the z-scores look like standard normal. What if we don't know sigma? What should we do? Well. Kind of common sense would tell us that we can estimate sigma. Sigma is the population standard deviation, right? What can I estimate the population standard deviation by? What can I estimate the population mean by? I take a sample, right? And I use the sample estimate. So I could use the sample standard deviation as an estimate for the population standard deviation. Now here's the problem. Even though the, the, the sample standard deviation is close to the population standard deviation, it's not the same. It is different. Which means that this thing no longer has a standard normal distribution. So what do we have to do? We have to look at a new distribution. This is called the t-distribution. Okay? So this, this, is a, this is the price that we have to pay for this. And by the way, this thing on the bottom is actually what's called the standard error. Sometimes the book calls sigma divided by the square root of n the standard error. That's not really true. This is a standard error. It's the estimated standard deviation of x bar. Okay? This, okay, so the book sometimes calls sigma divided by the square root of n the standard error. That's not really correct. This is, this is a standard error. It's the estimated standard deviation of x bar. What exactly is that? Is that the estimated? That's the sample standard deviation, right? So just like you have a sample mean that estimates population mean, S estimates sigma, right? Okay, now what is the T distribution? Well, the T distribution is really cool, okay? And it turns out that, you know, long story short, this, the T scores should be like the Z scores. The Z scores have a normal, standard normal distribution. So the T scores should have something like that, okay? 
So it turns out that this t distribution looks a lot like the standard normal. They both are centered at zero. Notice the standard normal cuts off at three, right? Which we totally expect. But the t distribution has a fatter tail. And so the, the way this distribution was founded is kind of cool. Did I tell you guys about the Guinness Brewery story? Okay. So historically, around, around 1910, Guinness was at the cutting edge of industry. So statistics was being used in agriculture, and Guinness was really tough on this stuff. They were like really big in quality control. So they had a, they had a guy by the name of William Goss that he was on staff. He was, a, he was a statistician, but he also had a really hard job. He had to test the beer. <laughs> Poor guy, you know. But here was his problem. His, his problem was this. He had to work with small samples. He couldn't drink a lot of beer or he'd be drunk on the job, right? So he had to work with small samples. And it turns out that when you work with small samples, this is what you start to see. And so Gossett's genius was not in, not in getting this distribution. It was realizing that this was not the same as this. He was a very careful, very observant person. And he realized these scales were fatter, consistently fatter. And so it led him to believe there was a new distribution and he went ahead and started to figure this stuff out. So that's kind of cool. So anyhow, that was that, that, that's Gossett's story. So how do we do computations? Well, you know, it's like the standard normal. It's, it's the same sort of way in stat crunch, right? Instead of going to normal, we go to T. Notice one thing that's different, though, is the parameters, right? For the standard normal, you didn't have to input anything. It's already set to, to, the, to the right parameters, right? Here you have to input a, what's called a, a degree of freedom. But this is easy to calculate. You just take the sample size, N, and you subtract 1. And that's what you put in. And then everything else is exactly the same. The rest of the computations are exactly identical. So it's really, really easy to do. OK. So you know, when can we use the t-distribution? So here's kind of the bottom line. When we don't know the population standard deviation and the sample size is large enough. Notice what's happening if we're having to use a central limit theorem like result, OK? And when is the sample size large enough? Well, basically, the guidelines are the same as before. When we know that the random variable is normal, we don't even worry about the sample size. When it's symmetric, we can use small sample sizes. As it gets more skewed, the sample sizes have to change. Just like we saw in activity three, right? Exactly the same thing. So how do we find the, the margin of error? So here's, the, here's our formula now. And, and you know, we said that on the final, right, you're allowed to bring like a little cheat sheet, a paper with formulas. This is not actually a bad formula to have. So let's, let's make a little table, okay? And let's see, here we'll put, um, is sigma known? And so, yes. No. Okay. Um, let's see. So we want to look at the critical value. So what is the critical value here? Well, we're, we're going to be looking at a 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval. Okay. So we're talking about this confidence interval. So the critical value here is the z-score for the alpha over two percentile. If sigma is not known, we have to use a t distribution. So this is a t distribution that has n minus one degrees of freedom. This is the parameter, okay? Comma alpha over two. So this is this is the value for the t score that has alpha over two in its left hand tail. What is the standard error? And, and I have to be a little careful. Um, let, let, let me call this standard deviation of x bar. Let me be a little careful with standard error. So here, the actual value is sigma over the square root of n. Here, it's s over the square root of n. So notice the similarities, right? And finally, what is the margin of error? So the margin of error is just the product. It's always equal to the standard deviation 
of x bar times the critical value. Okay, this is what it always is. So here, what is it? The margin of error is sigma divided by the square root of n times the critical value using the z-score. Okay. Here, I have a standard error. I'm going to multiply s divided by the square root of n times the critical value for the p-score. And so this, these, are my, these are my margin of errors. These are the formulas. And these are very useful formulas. So we're going to use these formulas a lot. Yeah. Is that better? Or worse? <laughs> okay. All right. Notice the absolute value sign. This this value is going to be negative. Okay. So you want to be a little careful. Margin of error is always positive. It's it's a it's a length. All right. So this is, the, this is the critical value. We find this using stat crunch, like I said, exactly the same way we find the critical value for the z-score. And so this is what it looks like, right? We go to calculators, t instead of normal. We have to put n minus 1, right? 1 minus the sample size. This is where I had sample size of 12. Okay, I put in one, the 1 minus confidence divided by 2, so I'm working with a 95% confidence interval here, right, with 2.5% 2. 2. of the tail, and that's going to be my critical value right here, my 2.3. So the, the best way to learn how to do this is, is, really, um, is, is really just to uh, do some problems. So any questions before we get into doing some problems? Okay. So let's go ahead and, and try some. So first of all, if, if we go back and um, here's what I'd like you to do. Let's go ahead and take a break. But while we're on break, um, at the very beginning, so go to StatCrunch and enter these salaries right here for these six numbers, OK? And we'll come back and analyze those. How did you enter them to the one column? Exactly. Yep. Yep. So I'm. So here, I'll just we'll make a we'll make something called like salaries, right? And then just go ahead and put them in. Does anybody want to read off the numbers? Do you have the PowerPoint? That way we can all. I'm sorry. You got it. Okay. 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 Looks good. Okay. So those are our those are our salaries. We'll come back and analyze those. All right. Thank you. 
Okay, so here's what I like to do. I want to construct a 99% confidence interval for the mean. And I'm going to try to give really detailed instructions, okay, so we really kind of understand what's going on here. So let's kind of start from the beginning. The first thing we always do, and it's, it's hard for people because they want to just dive in and start calculating stuff, is we have to look at the data. You always have to look at the data before you do anything, right? So the first step is, maybe I call it step zero. Let me see. I might have. OK. Uh, let me get down here. OK, so the first step we have to, we have to kind of ask ourselves, can we use the central limit theorem? What do I mean by that? What is this? What is this question kind of getting at? Does it have a normal curve? What's that? Does it have a normal curve? So I want to know. I want to know two things. I want to know first of all, is the data kind of symmetric, right? So, so basically, I'm looking at the conditions I need to use the central limit theorem. So to use the central limit theorem, one of two things has to be true, right? Either the plot of x is, you know. Symmetric, normal if you want to say that, approximately normal, or our sample size is large enough. So what is, a, what is our sample size here? Six. Is that a large sample? No. So we definitely have to look at the distribution. So we go ahead and we plot the data values. So let's make a, let's make a dot plot first. Whenever we have this, this few data points, right, we just make a dot plot. And how could I tell by looking at the dot plot if it's symmetric or not? Oops. Mm. Well, one way we can tell symmetry by looking at the points, right? When you have a, a really that few points, it's not so easy to tell, perhaps. But I can compute the mean and the median, right? And the mean and the median are close. I know it's pretty symmetric. If you look at those two values, the median is 53.5, the mean's 54. Those are those are pretty close, okay? But we can probably say that that's symmetric enough. Okay, so it seems like it's okay. So here n is small, but it looks symmetric. So we're OK. So, so now we can actually go ahead and, and do the confidence interval. So the next thing we want to do is we want to kind of organize the information, right? We need to kind of put all the information together here. CI stands for confidence interval. Remember what the hypothesis test is said the first step we did was we wrote down those six pieces of information, right? Who about the population? Who about the samples? Who about the test? What information do I need to compute the confidence interval? Well, think about what it is for a second, right? Where is the confidence interval centered? At the sample means, right? So I need to get the sample means. This is going to be the center. 
I need the sample standard deviation, and I need the sample size. I need those three things, right? Why do I need this? I need this because this is going to give me the standard error, right? This is going to be S divided by the square root of N. That's going to come, that's going to come in with a margin of error. And, and I also need one more thing, which is what? I need the confidence, right? So notice I need four things. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to compute the, the margin of error. So you want to remember that the margin of error is always equal to, and I'm going to use the word standard error in quotes just because it's easy to do. It's a standard error times the critical value. And, and, so, oh, oh, and, and so, by the way, if I actually do this for this problem, what are these values? Well, you can do the summary statistics, right? If you do, you'll find out that for our problem, the sample mean is 54. The sample standard deviation is 5.65. And the sample size is n. I mean, sample size is, is 6. Okay. And the confidence here is it's 99%. I want the 99% confidence error. Okay. So the standard error is really easy. It's always S divided by the square root of N. So I just put these numbers in, right? 4.65 divided by the square root of 6. And that's about 1.89, if I remember correctly. That's the, that's the standard error. Just, just put this in our calculators, right? I mean, just kind of just work it out. Uh, right, so we take 6 square root 1 over times 4.65. Just to make sure. Yeah, 1.898. Critical value, we're going to have to use stat crunch, right? So what is this? Well, I'm going to figure out alpha first, right? Alpha is 1 minus the confidence. So in our case, this means that alpha is going to be equal to, you know, um, you know, you can do it different ways. I'm going to write the confidence as a, as a decimal, okay, a percentage of a decimal. So this means alpha is 0.01. And now I'm going to use the fact that the critical value is equal to the absolute value of the t-score the t-distribution was n minus 1 degrees of freedom and the alpha over 2 percentile. So for our case, this is going to be equal to the t-score for 5 degrees of freedom because n is 6 and this is going to be 0 0.005. Yes. And so we go to stack crunch. And let's go to stack crunch and work this out because this is the hard part of the problem, right? So we go to stat crunch, stat, and usually we go to normal, right? Now we go to T, and I have five degrees of freedom. It's always one less than the sample size, right? And I'm going to put half of alpha down here. And so my T score ends up being minus 4.032, but I'm going to take the absolute value, right? We should get minus 4.032. Okay, that's my critical value. That's telling me how many standard deviations wide I have to make the margin of error. Okay. So now, now we're basically ready. All I'm going to do is multiply these two. So my standard error is 1.898 times my critical value, which is 4.032, and that comes out to 7.65 roughly. That's my that's my margin of error. Okay. Yeah. Would the confidence interval simply be random occurrence? Or something? That's a that's a really good question. So there's two answers to that. The first is that 
Um, in this problem, you're always going to be given the constant, okay? Sometimes it's a little bit like hypothesis test, where they don't say, just like that was 0.05, right? Your confidence will be 95%. Usually it's the same. Well, the question is, what values, what confidence level are you interested in actually doing? Well, in reality, it's very much like alpha, actually. Were you interested in 90% confidence interval, 95 or 99? Those are the three, the three different uh, sizes of confidence we're interested in. If the confidence is too low, like if the confidence is 80%, that really isn't that meaningful. When the confidence goes up, like it's 99.99% confidence interval, the problem is the confidence interval becomes too wide and it's just useless. Yeah. So those are the values that we usually choose. Okay, so we go ahead and just compute those guys. And so this is what we have, right? You know, we have the margin of error is the product of these two things. We can find the critical value by first finding the mean degree of freedom. And then we compute the percentile from the confidence. We take one minus the confidence and divide it by two. And then we just go ahead and we find the p-score that has alpha over two in its left tail for five degrees of freedom. And then we go ahead and multiply them and we get our answer. And now we're ready to go ahead and actually compute the, the, the confidence interval. So now we're, now we're basically done. So the last step is just compute the confidence interval. I'm sorry? You put that one like up top. You know what? This one doesn't move. Oh, okay. But, but you know what? I will do it. Let's see. Can we do it? We can do it down here. No, no, no. I just you covered it. That's yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry about that. No, no, no. It's fine. Um, let, let me go ahead and put it down here. Here. So step four. I can't provide the adapter over time, right? Compute the confidence interval. So we, we already know what the confidence interval is. It's going to be x bar minus the margin of error, x bar plus the margin of error. Think about the poles. If this, if this formula would make sense, think about poles, right? When they say 45% plus or minus 2%, how do you interpret that? 45 plus or minus 2%. This is the 45 minus 2%, right? 45 plus 2%. And so we go ahead and put our values in, right? Um, this is going to be 54 minus 7.65 and 54 plus 7.65 and this comes out to be what's uh, 43 hold on, hold on, I'm sorry 46.35 right and 61.65 And so this is this is the this is the picture, right? This is our x bar of 54. This is our lower endpoint at 46.35. This is our upper endpoint at 61.65. And there's our confidence interval. So again, you know, I'm just going to reemphasize that the interpretation is important. But just like when we stated the conclusion for a hypothesis test. We were really kind of careful about our language. The same thing is true here. What we say at the end is we say we are 95% confident that the true average salary is between 46.35,000 and 61,650. So now you have some room for, for negotiation. You know, if you get offered a salary of 58,000, well, the true average could be somewhere in there you might say, hey, it's reasonable to ask for a little more money, right? Because the, the average could be all the way up to 61.65. So then you can kind of, you can kind of bargain with this as well. So this is, this is the idea behind confidence interval. Now, like most things in life, there's an easy way and a hard way. So this is actually the hard way. So let me show you the easy way. Suppose you wanted to compute the confidence interval just from the data. Here's how we do it. We go up to stat, T stat, one sample with data. And all we're going to do is just click on the variable, set the confidence level, 
It's that kind of moment of choice. So let me let me turn this off, okay? Turn it off. So here we go. With data, there's my salary. I want a 99% confidence interval, and I just hit compute, and that's it. Easy peasy, right? So if on the homework you have your choice, this would definitely, or on an exam, right? You would definitely do it this way to save time. You wouldn't do it by hand, okay? But you should know how to do it by hand because I might ask you that question too, right? And, and notice we get the same answer, right? The, so if, if, we, if we interpret this, what does this say? This says the lower limit, the lower endpoint, right, is 46.35, the last of the found. The upper limit, the upper endpoint, 61.65. It tells us the standard of error, which we knew. We figured that out. It tells us the degrees of freedom. It tells us the sample mean. If I give you that output, suppose I just show you the output on the exam, and I ask you for the margin of error, could you tell me what the margin of error is? All you saw was this. This is an output. What is, how do I get the margin of error? Well, let me ask you a question. If, if you look at this picture down here, this is kind of a graph of the, of the, of the confidence interval. Where is the margin of error on this, on this picture? Yeah. Could you just subtract the lower and upper limit from the upper? Exactly. All right, so there's two ways to do it. You can subtract the lower from the upper and divide by two or the upper from the mean, because this is the margin of error right here, right? Okay. So we can subtract the upper from the lower. That, that's usually the easiest way, right? The mean is the margin of error. Or you can subtract this from this and just divide it by two, all right? So um, what, uh, what questions do we have? Everybody's good? Right. Excellent. Um, let me see. I think there's one, there's two, two things I want to go through before we, we finish today. So we saw how to get it from data, okay, which is good. And so there's, there's a couple of things that we have to kind of review before we end. The first is that as the confidence increases, the interval becomes wider. And again, that's common sense. So I want to be more confident, but I'm containing a, a, a wider interval. As the sample size increases, the interval becomes smaller. Well, if you think about it again, it makes sense, right? Larger samples, more precise estimates, smaller error bars. Now, why does that happen mathematically? Well, the reason why it happens mathematically mostly is because of this. Right? The estimated standard deviation for x bar goes down as the sample size goes up. That's the major reason. Be a, be a little careful with, with, with t-scores. Notice something in this example. This t-score is really big relative to a z-score. So remember that t-scores are usually bigger than, than a z-score. Okay? If you had a z-score of 4, that will almost never occur. Right? This, this actually is not that uncommon. Okay? Because again, for small sample sizes, what's happening is that, that, that distribution is getting fatter. So you can have larger values. All right? Um, again, you know, you have to remember confidence is not the probability. We never say the probability that the actual um, the actual average in, in this interval is 95%. We have no idea if the, if the true value of mu is in there or not. We never know. And that's life. We just have that uncertainty. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do... Um, oh, there, there is one last thing I want to say. And I'm not, I don't think we're going to do a lot with this, but it's just the observation that a confidence interval is equivalent to a, a, a two-sided hypothesis test. So here's, so here's what I mean. Here's what this means. If you run, so for a 99% confidence interval, if I run a hypothesis test at 1%, I'll give a 1%, and I test any value in here, I will fail or reject. If I test any value off here, I will, I will reject. So actually a confidence interval in some sense is really useful because not only does it give you the estimate and it gives you the range of mu's, it also gives you the results for literally an infinite number of hypothesis tests. If I run the hypothesis test for any value between this and this, it's out to equal to 1%, I'll fail or reject. 
And again, it makes sense. If this interval, if I'm if I'm 99% confident that the true mean has to be in here, then if I choose any mean in here and I run a hypothesis test, I should fail to reject. I should still believe that this is the actual actual value. Okay. So that, that's 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 kind of a tangential point. We're not going to deal with that a lot. Okay, so the last thing I want to mention is um, there are some practice problems. We won't get to the practice problems today, obviously, but what I will do is I'll make a video tonight, strongly urge you to go through the practice problems on your own. If you get stuck, watch the video. Doing these problems will make your life infinitely easier when you do the homework, okay? Money back guarantee. All right, good class. I'll see you guys on Thursday. Thanks.